Okay, good afternoon, and thank you all for tuning in today. With me is Dr. Con Cami Condola, the Chief Public Health Officer for the Northwest Territories. Uh, I want to also thank the media who are tuned in as well today. You're, you continue to support our efforts to keep people informed, and as I always say, we couldn't do this without you. You're critical for our communications. Over the last eight months, the Government of the Northwest Territories has been working hard to make sure residents are safe and have the most up-to-date information as we continue to navigate the COVID-19 pandemic. We are seeing the impacts of the second wave across the country, including our northern neighbours to the east and west of us, as they grapple with increasing numbers. Our success in limiting the number of cases can be contributed to our pandemic efforts to protect our residents and communities. But we are not immune to the virus, and it will only be a matter of time before we see more cases in the Northwest Territories. That is why we're committed to holding bi-weekly pandemic updates to speak directly to residents about the government's response to the pandemic. It's important that we have, you have the information you need to make informed decisions and can do your part to protect yourself and those around you. Unlike the rest of Canada, we've been able to keep our numbers low. But as I said earlier, it's only a matter of time before we see an increase in cases and it's important that we have the necessary tools and information available to limit the spread. To support residents, we've launched in partnership with the Government of Canada, the COVID-19 Exposure Notification App. The COVID Alert app helps to notify users if they may have been exposed to someone who has tested positive for COVID-19. The application is free and voluntary, but I strongly urge all residents to download the app if they can, are able to do so. Users who test positive for the virus will get a one-time key code from their health authority that they can enter into the app and will then notify other users who have come into contact with that person for a minimum of 15 minute time period and provide next steps based on the health advice of our chief public health officer. Our right to privacy is something we all hold close. And I want to assure residents that the COVID Alert app uses strong measures to protect any data it collects. And it does not track a user's location or collect personal information that would be able to identify who you are. The Privacy Commissioner of Canada has been closely involved with the COVID Alert app and is supportive of its use by Canadians. To learn more about the app and how it works, visit the Government of Canada website and again, I urge all residents to please use the app if you are able. The COVID Coordinating Secretariat has been working hard to ensure our pandemic services are supporting the needs of residents. Improving the way that the government manages and pays for the COVID-19 measures and services that have been protecting our territory, like Protect NWT, the Compliance and Enforcement Task Force, 811 and travel restrictions was one of the commitments the government made when it created the Secretariat. On Tuesday, the Secretariat released a What We Heard report that provides a summary of input re received about self-isolation locations and payment for isolation centre stays from Indigenous governments, community governments and business stakeholders. The health and safety of residents of the Northwest Territories continues to be the top priority for the government. And we recognize that policies and measures that we have put in place to protect people from COVID-19 need to evolve as our understanding of the virus and the risk to territorial residents both evolve. Since establishing the COVID Secretariat, we've taken a thorough look at how we're implementing COVID-19 measures and I've identified some ways that we can make them easier on residents while ensuring that we're still able to manage the risk of COVID-19 spreading into our communities. The Secretariat held engagement sessions between October 28th and November 3rd, 2020 to seek input about communities where people could self-isolate and who should pay for individuals to stay in isolation centres. Participants communicated different experiences and ideas that emerged as key themes in the What We Heard report. 
The results show there's different points of view about self-isolating at home in the smaller communities. Most of the feedback, however, was in support of reducing the isolation centre costs for taxpayers. I want to thank all the organisations who were available for these discussions on short notice and appreciate all the input put provided by participants. Before I turn it over to Dr. Candola, I want to provide an update on our pandemic services. Moving forward, I'll be providing regular updates on statistics for a number of the pandemic services that the Secretariat is tasked with managing. It's important to note that the latest statistics are based on data collected up until November 21st. So when we report, we'll always be a little bit behind. Recently, the Secretariat upgraded the Protect NWT and 811 phone system to improve services for business and residents. A total of 1,036 calls and 562 emails were made during the week of November 15th to the 21st, and 85% of those were resolved during the contract, contact. There's currently 605 pending self-isolation plans being reviewed and 1,079 travellers self-isolating at this time, as of November 21st. Since the beginning of the pandemic, a total of 27,244 self-isolation plans have been submitted to protect NWT. There were 250 residents using isolation centres in Yellowknife, Anuvik, Hay River and Fort Smith on as of just November 21st, bringing the total number of travellers who have used our isolation centres to 4,080 since they opened. From November 15th to the 21st, there was also a total of 348 vehicles that crossed the border. Since we implemented checkpoints at our border crossings, there's been a total of 14,875 vehicles crossing the border. This includes 5,679 private vehicles and 9,196 commercial vehicles. We have seen a steady decrease in the number of vehicles crossing the border since the end of September, which is likely due to the onset of the cold weather and our winter season. In the same time period, 663 passengers screened through the territorial airports and Secretariat staff successfully handled 43 arriving flights. In total, 18,382 airplane passengers have entered the territory since November 21st, as of November 21st, sorry. Public health officers serve all regions of the territory to enforce the public health orders. Compliance and enforcement operations work to educate the people and businesses on the rules, investigate complaints, and deal with non-compliance. And they can issue written warnings or tickets if the rules continue to be ignored. From November 15th to 21st, a total of 103 new cases were opened and 75 cases were addressed and closed. Since enforcement began, there's been 3,302 total complaints related to enforcement issues. The total number of verbal and written warnings issued during the pandemic is 440, and a total of 34 tickets of $1,725 have been issued across the territory. The majority of non-compliance has been re being reported is related to people not isolating as outlined in their self-isolation plan or as the self-isolation uh, protocols recommend. The last 25 charges have all been for NWT residents who fail to self-isolate. Uh, the pandemic is spreading across Canada uncontrollably. It's important now that every resident self-isolate, abide by their self-isolation plans. And if you see someone that's not, please report to Protect NWT. This is a time that we have to be more diligent. We'll continue to provide regular updates on our pandemic services, and we'll be making these numbers available on the government's COVID-19 webpage. As the holiday season nears, it's important we find time to take care of our mental health and well-being 
and those of our loved ones. One of the lasting legacies of COVID-19 will be how we treated each other. And I encourage you all to show compassion, kindness, and empathy. It's the way of the North. With the high number of cases in Southern Canada, we must continue to do our part to limit the spread of COVID-19 in our communities, such as abide, abiding by this, the Chief Public Health Officer's recommendations and keeping our bubbles small. As Northerners, we're resilient and we will find ways to keep connected to our loved ones safely during the holiday season. Lastly, please remember to wash your hands, keep your distance, wear a mask, and be kind to one another. We're all in this together. Thank you. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Condola to provide her remarks. Thank you again. Good afternoon. When daily case spikes as high as 6,100 cases across Canada, we are in uncharted territory. And in recent weeks, the North has seen how quickly the second wave can wash up on our once calm shores. Reducing our risk requires collective action from everyone across our territory. One of the most powerful steps to take is to avoid any travel outside the Northwest Territories if you can. Limit non-essential trips into the territory as well, especially from areas experiencing high levels of community transmission. Cases across Canada are rising at an unprecedented rate. And in the coming weeks, we're going to see the numbers rise even more. The risk of contracting COVID-19 during travel will also continue to grow. And with more COVID-19 comes more chances for outbreaks to happen. If you must travel, be mindful that COVID-19 is always a risk. Follow all local rules and restrictions Keep up with healthy habits like wearing masks in all public spaces, hand washing, physical distancing, and avoiding crowds and gatherings. And when you come back, please be a responsible self-isolator to keep our friends, our families, and our communities safe. If you are planning to visit family in our territory, my strong recommendation would be to explore connecting digitally instead. When we move, COVID-19 moves. And as our friends in Yukon, British Columbia have said, limited non-essential travel between provinces and territories is the best thing for us all right now. But limiting travel is no silver bullet. We are not in a bubble and we cannot keep COVID-19 out. So we are preparing for when it comes. Today, we expanded the symptoms which would spur testing have now indicated anyone with any symptoms should be assessed for COVID-19 tests. These symptoms reflect the latest guidance by the Public Health Agency of Canada and for the Centers for Disease Control in the US. Look out for these three new additional symptoms. Stay home and contact your healthcare provider for more advice. And these include abdominal pain, skin changes or rashes, and chills. And remember, any of the following symptoms should spur you to call your healthcare provider to be assessed and stay home until they give you a guidance. So once more, I just want to go for all the symptoms that would um, spur you to stay home and check with the healthcare provider. So those would include fever, new or worsening cough, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, general feeling of unwellness, chills, muscle aches, fatigue or weakness, sore throat, congestion or runny nose, headache, diarrhea, nausea or vomiting, loss of sense of smell or taste, skin changes or rashes, loss of appetite. We know from the recent outbreaks in Nunavut that sometimes community transmission can happen for a while before it is caught. By monitoring ourselves closely for symptoms, and treating that little cough or sniffle as something to investigate, we can help prevent that reality in our territory. We've also coordinated with the Department of Education, Culture and Employment on updating screening tools 
to reflect these changes. As part of the updated school screening tool, loss of taste and smell has been removed as a minor symptom and moved to a fourth major symptom. This reflects the fact that many COVID-19 cases around the globe have been found to present with this particular symptom. If students experience any of the major symptoms, including fever, cough, difficulty breathing, or loss of taste or smell, they cannot attend class until they have been assessed by a healthcare provider and provided with information on when they can return. If they experience any of the other minor symptoms, they do need to stay home for 24 hours. If the symptoms have resolved, they can return to school. If they do not, or more symptoms show up, they must stay home and consult with a healthcare provider on next steps. These common sense guidelines will protect our public while reducing disruption to learning. We're also running one of the most ambitious wastewater testing programs in the country. Wastewater testing is now set up in Fort Simpson, Yellowknife, Fort Smith, Inuvik, and Hay River. This allows us to see whether COVID-19 is present, the COVID-19 virus is present in a community and how strong that signal is. It will help target advice on testing and self-isolation to recent travelers and put local measures in place to pre prevent transmission if required. And ultimately, it will better prepare us to respond to outbreaks and monitor our containment effort. We have also tightened our self-isolation rules to reflect the heightened risk of getting COVID-19 while traveling. As we make our way through winter, it is crucial for everyone in your household to self-isolate if anyone you live with has traveled outside the NWT. And with the COVID Alert app, we now have another tool to get the right advice for those who have, may have been exposed to the COVID-19 virus. But our readiness will only take us so far. What happens when COVID-19 is present in our territory is up to every individual in Northwest Territory. It is up to our individual efforts to stick to the healthy habits we know work to stop COVID-19 in its tracks. That means keeping physical distance of at least six feet, wearing masks when you're out, keeping crowds small and spaces large, washing your hands frequently, staying home if you're feeling even a little sick, calling your local health center to be assessed if you have any COVID-19 symptoms, and responsibly self-isolating when required. By sticking to these simple habits, we can protect ourselves and protect each other. Businesses and organizations should also be consider considering their increased risk across the country and looking at additional mitigation measures to beef up their exposure control plans. Now is a good time to look at ways to accommodate greater distancing, encouraging smaller crowds, and think about introducing masking policies, especially in the hospitality sector. When possible, please track who comes in and out your business. This will help avoid public notifications should a COVID exposure occur. These are ways to take control of your risk as a business while keeping your clients and your staff safe. And I know these sacrifices are not easy. We have been at this for a long, long time, and we know everyone is tired. That fatigue has, is because stability we have today was hard won. It was built on the collective efforts of everyone in our territory. With glimpses of light at the end of the tunnel, we need to keep our eyes on the road. Because if we don't, then we risk the progress that made those sacrifices worth it. So these are important, critical months ahead. So let's make them matter. Thank you. Thank you, Premier. Thank you, Dr. Candola. Uh, we will turn to the question and answer portion of this update. Um, I would just like to remind media that are on the line that uh, you will be provided an opportunity to ask one question and a follow-up. Um, and I will be proceeding with the first in line, who is Luke Carroll, and that will be from CKLB. Luke? 
Hello? You are on the line. Okay, perfect. Um, so this question is for Premier Cochrane. Uh, yeah, Premier Cochran. Um, so based on the findings in those engagement sessions you hosted, um, can we expect any changes for self-isolation regulations? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, we're just at the final process of uh, reviewing the uh, what we heard reports and making decisions. In short order, though, you will see we will be doing a media uh, release on on uh, changes, possible changes to this to the self isolation, that'll be coming within the next short while. And a follow up um, again for Premier Cochran uh, with discussions around uh, foreseeable vaccine. I was wondering if you have had any discussions with the federal government about the distribution of a vaccine here in the Northwest Territories? Definitely. All premiers, we meet uh, weekly. In fact, I'll be going into a meeting at 2 o'clock here in the next little while. I'll be a little bit late for that one. Um, we, we're meeting weekly with the federal government. All premiers are at that table. We've been talking about the vaccination. My understanding it's at the last uh, stage of, uh, of testing. And um, we are hopeful that it'll be released in, in the spring, uh, is what we're looking at. And we've all agreed across Canada that there would be a, a protocol in how we deal with the vaccinations, starting with um, uh, our highest at risk. So people that are seniors, uh, immune systems compromised, et cetera, and then working with the health care providers, those who are providing supports to health care, and eventually to the general population. Um, Canada has been a, a huge partner in this. They will be taking part in the distribution of it. And uh, although it will be distri distri uh, distributed probably per capita, we expect that, um, that the territories will get its fair share. Indigenous communities are also amongst the highest uh, at risk as well, which represents uh, a huge part of our territory. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Megan Brackenbury from Cabin Radio. Megan, are you on the line? Can you guys hear me all right? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry. Um, I, I was just going to ask, so you said that a thing is going, a sorry, changes to the self-isolation protocols are going to be coming within the next short while. What is that specific time frame? What does next short while mean? In politics, uh, in, uh, respectfully, um, Megan, is, is uh, I would love to be able to say, with uh, give you a deadline, but we are finalizing it, so... Um, I would say within the next couple of weeks, you will we'll have figured that out, and we will be doing a press release on that um, specific item. Thank you. Um, and then a follow-up. I know, obviously, travel is discouraged. So is your message to students and those working outside the NWT but who live and have families in the MWT don't come home for Christmas? I think the message is right now is that the risk is high throughout the Northwest Territories or throughout Canada, throughout the world. The risk is high. We're at the, the our second wave is hitting harder than I think anybody would have projected. Um, it's going to be tough for parents and it's tough for students. Uh, I also have a student, uh, children that are down south in post-secondary, and, and it was a tough decision. But um, on my own side, my children won't be returning uh, there will be a risk. Uh, those children will be needed to self-isolate before they can take part in any events. Um, and if they don't have the proper isolation, the whole family will have to self-isolate. So far, my understanding, the Chief Public Health Officer hasn't made an order on that. But um, the recommendation is, um, unless it's essential travel, uh, we're recommending that uh, people not return home or um, make sure that they do follow the orders and self-isolate if they do. Great. 
Great. Uh, next, we have uh, Sydney Cohen from CDC. Sydney, are you on the line? Uh, Andrew, what is the uh, the number there for Sydney? Can I just get you to unmute all the uh, phone numbers that are listed there, please? Sydney, are you there? Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I guess um, kind of just a following up to the Christmas question, are there any plans to, um, you know, tighten or loosen any kind of restrictions or kind of go back a phase um, ahead of the holidays when we're expecting possibly more travel? Um, just, just to clarify, in, in, in Canada, we're not So the, the Chief Public Health Officer of Canada has um, made the rec recommendation to all Canadians not to travel. In the Northwest Territories, we've also made the recommendation to avoid non-essential travel, both in and out of the territories, especially during the Christmas period. In terms of um, tightening, tightening up or um, introducing re restrictions, last week I introduced two new public health advisories. One was the suspension of the Nunavut bubble, and the other one was the um, requirement that if you are self-isolating, if you've an out of territory travel and you're coming in and um, ideally, if you can self-isolate alone, that would be good. But if you have to self-isolate with your family, the entire household has to self-isolate during this period. Um, what we're seeing is an increase in daily cases. We know that the long winter um, days are still ahead of us. We know that the respiratory season just um, usually starts around now and increases when we have increased travel from the south, typically. We start to see our outbreaks of flu in um, late December, early January. So for a whole host of reasons, um, it's better that we have a different type of Christmas this year and we stay put. Regarding um, those two are my res the restrictive regulations that I put in place um, in terms of orders. In terms of going back a phase, if we are continuing to just see travel-related cases, no evidence of community-wide transmission, um, compliance with the self-isolation, we can stay at phase two, and hopefully we can stay at phase two throughout the holidays. But it all depends on our collective action. For that, and um, this is an, an indirect follow, but you mentioned the wastewater um, testing that you're doing. When can we expect to see some results from that and have a sort of better sense of whether there's COVID present in, in the Northwest Territories? Thank you. We're regularly testing our, our wastewater. Um, for the month of November, there have been no detects. Um, we've um, been it's Yellowknife, Fort Simpson, and Inuvik are sending the data. Um, Fort Smith is now sending us um, sampling, and Hay River, their auto sampler was just installed, so we expect to see that. So there is pretty much, for the month of November, nothing to report. However, we are working, our, my epidemiology unit is working to develop a dashboard that we can have displayed so everyone else can see what those results are. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Thomas Ethier from Radio Taiga. Thomas, are you on the line? Thomas, are you there? Okay. Um, I guess we'll move on. Uh, we have Paul Bickford from the Hay River Hub. Uh, Dr. Kendall, uh, I, I had some questions about the wastewater testing. A lot of them have been answered, but 
Can you tell me when exactly the, the wastewater testing equipment was installed here in Hay River and when, when the testing began? So the um, Hay River auto sampler required an additional plumbing and that just uh, was placed, I believe it was this week. So Hay River will be sending their samples shortly, but they haven't sent their sampling yet, as of yet, but they have installed the auto sampler. Okay, good. So, do, so the test, so the samples haven't been uh, sent yet. So, do you have any any idea when when the results might be available for for uh, for Hay River, or is that is that still still to be determined? Sent samples. Um, I uh, Yellowknife and Fort Simpson Inuvik have been sending samples um, throughout the month, and it's a matter of training the uh, collection people who are collecting the samples and sending the samples. I don't have a timeline on that, but the biggest uh, hurdle that we have uh, overcome is we had to have additional um, requirements to insert the auto sample, and that was achieved this week, which was which was good. So we can have samples ready before the holidays, which is our goal. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'm just going to circle back to Thomas if his mic is working now. Um, Thomas, do you want to ask your question? I think it's still not working, but uh, I will ask his question for him because he did provide it to me through the chat. Uh, his question would be about the possible changes to the isolation protocol while we wait for the details, but could making travelers pay a part of their stay at isolation centers be part of the options that are being looked at? Uh, Premier, I believe that would be a question for you. Uh, thank you, Andrew, um, on behalf of uh, Thomas. <laughs> um, that was one of the stronger recommendations within the What We Heard report. Uh, again, there was other recommendations we're looking at. Um, we we're, we have to find a balance between keeping people safe, um, providing supports, and then, of course, being accountable to the taxpayers for the, the money that we're spending. So, uh, like I said earlier, within the next couple of weeks, we will uh, be ready to release to the public on, on more so. We already released the findings of the report, but the decision that Cabinet has made as we move forward. Thank you, Premier. Uh, next in line, uh, we have uh, Sarah Minogue from CBC. Sarah, are you on the line? Sarah's actually not going to ask any questions, so it's okay. You can move on. She's just listening in. Okay. Uh, next in line would be Bailey Morton from Moose FM. Bailey, are you on the line? Yeah, I am. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you, Premier and Dr. Candola. Um, I think this is a question for Dr. Candola, but maybe for the Premier as well. Um, you've been talking about the timeline for um, distributing vaccines um, when they get approved, but I was wondering how you would assess the readiness of the territory to um, distribute and actually administer the vaccines, especially in smaller communities where there may not be the um, medical facilities that we have in Yellowknife. Okay, thank you. Um, so the uh, how we would roll that out, the Department of Health and Social Services is responsible for the uh, vaccinations uh, distribution throughout the territories. However, in saying that, we're working really closely with the federal government. Um, when Nunavut uh, broke out with their uh, cases just recently, the federal we reached out to the federal government and they've offered to come in and, and support us as well. They realize that uh, within the territories we have uh, we have uh, we don't have the healthcare facilities to be able to handle a huge outbreak. So the federal government is going to be working one on one with us uh, to uh, prepare for if and when we get a community outbreak. But also we've had uh, contact from the task force, which is really incredible, and they've offered to uh, provide some support for us as well with the distribution. So there are a few factors we need to look at. The first vaccination, of course, being uh, kept at minus 70 uh, does provide a few uh, obstacles for us. 
but the federal government is uh, conscious, aware of that, and are, are working with us closely to make sure that, uh, that all of our people will receive the vaccinations in a timely period. And I don't know if the, uh, Dr. Kendola has anything more to add to that, but I'd like to give her the opportunity if she does. The territory has had experience rolling out uh, mass immunization during a pandemic. Um, I was the chief medical health officer 2009 when we had the H1N1 pandemic and we had um, rolled out the H1N1 vaccine relatively in a short period of time quickly and had one of the second highest rates of vaccination, vaccination for that particular influenza vaccine. We know the value of working together and so working groups have already been established. Working groups between um, the health and social services and the health authorities, but also working groups um, between uh, the territory and the federal government. It is um, is a great time to plan and it's a great time to be ready and we're, we're on it right now. Uh, yes, thank you for that. Um, I was also wondering, um, the federal chief public health officer has talked in recent days about um, misinformation and anti-vaccine sentiment that could be um, distributed online via social media or other means. I was wondering um, what, if any, efforts you have to make sure Northwest Territories residents are encouraged to get vaccinated when it happens and to deal with any anti-vaccine sentiment there may be. I think it's really important to communicate to the NWT public about the efficacy of a vaccine, any um, potential safety issues, to be very open with all the information and evidence we have. And at the end of the day, um, the NWT resident needs to make an informed decision. When we were dis um, distributing the H1N1 vaccine, we had a similar scenario of misinformation and people are afraid to take the vaccine. And so we would counter that type of um, pushback with more with information, with communication, um, providing credible sources of material and allowing the individual to make an informed decision. Thank you, Dr. Kendola. Uh, next in line, we have, uh, last but not least, we have Simon Whitehouse from Northern News Services. Simon, are you on the line? Simon, uh, if you're not there, I guess we are at the end of the question and answer period. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for attending today. And uh, thank you, uh, Premier Cochran and Dr. Candola for uh, making yourself available. We spread the message. Uh, you're a huge part of, of the answer. Thank you again.